Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honored guests. Uh, my name is Mike Indurno. I'm the cultural attaché of Denmark here in New York, and I'm very happy to announce that we are now ready to begin this Saturday's uh, full day symposium, Danish Design Review New York 2012. First, we will have uh, welcome remarks by three very distinguished speakers, <coughs> beginning with the uh, president of the New School, David von Sant, uh, followed by Parsons Executive uh, Dean, Joel Towers, and then uh, lastly, from our own Consul General of Denmark uh, in New York, Ambassador Jarl Fries Massen. And those three uh, speakers will help us set the scene for what is going to happen here uh, in this room today. Thank you. I'll give it over to Van Sant. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you got some coffee outside and are, are beginning to get awake. Uh, it's wonderful for the New School to be hosting, uh, hosting this event in conjunction with the Danish uh, Design Center and the Consul, uh, Consul General of Denmark. I want to extend a special welcome uh, to Ambassador uh, Jarl Fridge Mautzen. Where, where is he? Where is he? There he is. Sorry. <laughs> Great to have you here as well, as well as Neil uh, Yule Sorensen, the CEO of, of the, Desi of the um, Danish Design Center. Uh, design is really central to just about everything we do here uh, at the New School. It, now, when I say design, I mean design very broadly, broadly defined. Uh, in my view, at least, design is about how do we, how do we organize and, and, and structure objects, environments, or organizations to be most effective for the users? Uh, and that can range from aesthetic issues to um, functional issues to, to social and political and social and political issues. And I think probably even more important is, is design thinking and, and the way that impacts what our students and our faculty do here uh, at the New School. Design thinking is a, is a collaborative uh, approach to problem solving and trying to figure out, uh, figure out how to do things better. And again, whether it, it deals with objects, products, or uh, organizations, or, or environments. And here at the New School, design is particularly strong, uh, in part because we're very strong also in social science and social research. And at the end of the day, design is about culture, culture and society. Uh, it's about people, how people use things, or use environments, or deal with, uh, deal with organizations. So it's very important as a designer to take into consideration cultural and social and cultural and social factors. Um, these strengths here at the New School uh, also are, are buttressed by our strong uh, sense of social engagement. And again, um, it's important for a designer. A designer has to be socially engaged. Uh, it may be in, in terms of just developing a product that has uh, uh, uses that, that make, society, make society better. Uh, we were tested here at the New School a couple of weeks ago with Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I was quite proud of the way our students and faculty and staff uh, came up with some very creative and, and solution-oriented ways of collaborating and becoming involved. Our students and faculty have also been very eager uh, to explore the implications of Sandy from a, a multiple number of perspectives, whether it's art and design, um, public policy, economy, environment, politics, or social justice. So here we challenge our students uh, not just to practice a design in a vacuum, but to be engaged citizens and open to partnerships and collaborations, um, and to know and, and, and make good design that is, that, that is smartly conceived, sustainable, uh, and affordable. Finally, uh, this is a great example of our various partnerships we have. Uh, it's important for our students and our faculty to reach out across the world and engage um, others, uh, others around. We are opening uh, in Europe, our, our reopening at least our Paris operation uh, in the coming weeks. Um, Dean Towers and I will be there to uh, kick that off. But it's important for our students to be in a global environment because, again, uh, learning what's happening around the world, being familiar with cultures and sensitive to cultures uh, all around the world is a key to a designer's a key to a designer's success. Um, we're especially pleased to be doing this with with both the design center as well as the the Danish government, and we certainly have a lot to learn from Denmark in terms of in terms of design. Uh, the Danish government's made a major investment in design, and I think it, it's great. Uh, uh, thanks to everyone from the consulate and otherwise who are here to help put uh, put this together. 
Okay, now I'd like to introduce uh, Joel Towers, who is our Executive Dean uh, at the Parsons, the New School for Design. Joel is a visionary and committed leader. Uh, he, along with me, have very high ambitions uh, for the potential of design and the development of design in, in the social context here at the New School. I've learned a lot from him, and I continue to learn from him. So Joel will tell us a little bit about the rest of the day and his own uh, view of design. Joel? Thank you, David. Um, uh, it's <laughs> humbling introduction. Um, I would say that uh, it's I who've been given the privilege to be learning and working with David in his um, first couple of years here now as president of New School. Thank you. Uh, and um, we, we find ourselves, um, as David said, in a very unique <coughs> position at Parsons <clears throat> to be able to work in a university that understands and positions design so centrally to its overall mission. So I'm very pleased to, to uh, have the opportunity to work with my colleagues in the faculty, uh, the many remarkable students that we have here at Parsons and across the new school to uh, advance the vision that David has laid out for the importance of design uh, globally. Um, I'm also very pleased to be ho helping to host this event here at Parsons uh, and to welcome our colleagues. Uh, I will say more about that in just a moment. Um, but just a few words, uh, a little bit more um, in depth about the kind of work that we're able to do and why events like this um, are so natural for us to feel uh, a part of um, our ongoing uh, curricular efforts and our, and our efforts to advance design and um, uh, a little bit of a, a shout out to our friend Paola Antonelli, who was actually the matchmaker in these efforts when we first uh, met to uh, talk about hosting this. So I was very pleased that she that she did that. Um, you know, Parsons, uh, as I said, in a university that in many ways is design-led, uh, provides us the opportunity to work across a range of disciplines uh, and with a range of different partners, nonprofit organizations, corporations, uh, governments, um, in order to be able to propose solutions to real-world issues. Uh, David mentioned how uh, we as a university have responded to the most recent real world issue of Hurricane Sandy. Um, but broadly, uh, uh, Parsons has been working for a long time, and the New School has, um, to address real world issues and just a few examples on urban development and healthcare. Um, recent partnerships that we've had include the Red Cross, the Open Society Institute, and Habitat for Humanity, all people uh, partnerships that we've been working directly with. Uh, we've also worked with the United Nations, which is a core theme of uh, today's uh, presentation on several projects, uh, including recently um, a hackathon to explore innovations in open source technology. This was a project we did with UN Global Pulse, um, and which has been, uh, I think, quite successful. Uh, we've also worked on communication strategies, strategies for global assessment report on disaster risk reduction with the UN International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, um, the UNISDR. Uh, we were, of course, participants in the World Urban Forum, organized by UN Habitat, most recently um, in Italy. Projects like these are critical to the Parsons education, uh, as they show students how human imagination and endeavor are constantly remaking the world. Uh, challenges indeed of our time require this, I would suggest to you, and that design is um, more essential now than it has ever been. And it's important for designers, I think, to focus their talents not simply on um, the image of things, the aesthetics uh, of how things appear, but how they fundamentally are in the world, or perhaps more important, how they could be. Um, I believe that we need designers to be more strategic and ecologically responsible that they have to understand that design is a vehicle not only for the production of objects, but of services and systems. Um, that they engage in conversations where the complexity of design and culture intersect. I think we also need to promote opportunities for cross-cultural exchange and dialogues like this one today are precisely uh, about that because they represent shared engagement with and with and through design and the ability to confront the complex challenges we face as a global community. The designers and the work that we will see today um, uh, coming out of uh, uh, the competitions that have been run and the young and uh, incredible educational system for design in Denmark um, to a person understand both the aesthetic the um, symbolic and the ecological implications of design. Uh, and so for us, this is 
um, also a, a huge opportunity to learn. Uh, so I believe it's really quite fitting that we come together today to celebrate the newly restored UN Council Chamber, uh, which will uh, not only showcase the best of contemporary Danish design, but provide a physical space for these exchanges to take place on a global scale. And finally, um, as David said, uh, we, are, um, re re we have a new chapter of our long history in Paris. We've been in Paris since 1921 uh, as Parsons, and um, this new chapter is very exciting. It is part of a, an approach to global education at the new school that is um, uh, understood and construed around a series of global hubs and a network that connects all of those hubs, each of those hubs being located in key cities around the world and connecting regions of critical importance through those hubs and globally uh, connecting them. So that design, which consists and works and uh, produces in a global environment, is also um, uh, understood locally and in regional uh, networks that relate to the specific geographies of place and history. So I'd like to thank uh, the Danish Design Center and uh, the Consulate General of Denmark for approaching us with this idea. Uh, for um, I'd also uh, like to thank our keynote speakers, Anthony Cohen, Matt Burke, uh, Karsten Stauer, Paola Antonelli. Um, I'd also locally like to thank David Lewis and Rama Chorpesh and Alan Bruton for um, making this happen very quickly. Uh, we, uh, it was, uh, um, we were just proving our agility. <laughs> <laughs> Which is important. You have to be. You have to be agile. Uh, and so, um, with that, it is my great pleasure uh, to turn over this podium to the Consul General, General of Denmark uh, in New York, uh, Ambassador uh, Jarl Fridge Madsen. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, uh, David. Um, on behalf of the uh, Consulate uh, General of uh, Denmark uh, here in New York, it is a great pleasure to welcome you <clears throat> here at the Parsons, uh, the new school for design, for this Danish Design uh, Review uh, 2012. And when we planned this, we thought, um, let's do this on a Saturday, uh, just to test if people are really committed. and. Uh, I would like to say that, that you, you guys who have showed up here, you are really committed. I have a few, uh, few children uh, uh, who are at the end of high school, beginning of uh, college, and I know how tough it is to get up this early in the morning. So thank you to all the students of Parsons who actually made it here. Um, as a male consul general, um, it is actually quite easy uh, to have the right uh, dress uh, for almost any uh, occasion, just put on a, a suit and a tie and you're uh, good to go. Um, one difference being the uh, Vienna Ball at the Waldorf Astoria. This is a white tie event uh, and unfortunately I showed up in a black tie, uh, which for a diplomat is extremely uh, embarrassing. Um, the, uh, the 200 Americans who were there, they didn't seem to, uh, who were also wearing black tie, they didn't seem to be too stressed about it. Uh, but since it's my profession, it was a problem. So, and, and today being, you know, a Saturday and being at a very hip uh, design school, I was also wondering a little bit what to wear. So I was, I was talking to uh, Mike about this yesterday. And she said, I think it's fine to put on a suit and a tie, but try to be a little bit hip. And, uh, and uh, yeah, you know, then, then you know what Mike thinks of my, my dress uh, on a normal basis. And then you might be thinking, because of course I did this, and you might be thinking, you know, how can a, a gray tie and a gray suit be hip? Well, actually, it, it lies in the socks. Uh, I'm, I'm, wearing, uh, I'm wearing pink socks uh, today. So this is, this is, the, uh, this is the hip uh, element. Anyway, uh, we're here to talk about another part of design, which is not uh, so much fashion. Uh, we, we will talk about New York and New York City and, and, uh, and design because I think in many ways these two things go hand uh, in hand. Um, it is like a symbiosis. It, it is maybe taking a little bit too far to say that one could not live without the other. Probably New York would get by. Uh, but there has been so much uh, mutual inspiration and Denmark has uh, played its mark or made its mark on, on New York City, key institutions like the UN, 
the Museum of Modern Art, which has 43,000 pieces of Danish uh, design uh, there as part of the 2004 uh, renovation, and also the streets of New York and the bicycle lanes of New York, which are inspired by uh, Copenhagen. New York, on the other hand, uh, has taken Danish design uh, to a level that only this incredible, dynamic, and innovative uh, city can do. And that story between Denmark and New York started back uh, 60 years ago when uh, Denmark was one of three countries, three Scandinavian countries, to, to furnish uh, one of the uh, halls, chambers at, uh, at the UN. And the Danish government chose, we made a, a, a quite uh, a remarkable decision to choose a very young, very talented, but relatively unknown uh, designer and architect, Finn Yu. And uh, with the work that he did um, at the um, at the chamber, the trusteeship uh, council chamber, uh, he became one of the fathers of uh, Danish modern, as as it has been known uh, since then. And uh, and Danish design has then, in all its shapes and forms, developed into a globally renowned brand in those uh, sixty years. The challenge for Denmark in recent years has then been to keep uh, the ideas and the craftsmanship of Danish design icons alive uh, while continuously looking forward uh, to innovation, talent of our contemporary Danish designers. You could call them the Finn Jules and the Arne Jacobsons of today. And therefore, under the headline uh, of living the legacy, designing the future, the Consulate General of Denmark has made uh, several events where we reopen and, and reinterpret a dialogue between tradition and innovation. And this is what we're doing today uh, with our partner, Danish Design uh, Center. Uh, and we look forward to introducing you to a select group of the most promising young Danish uh, artists, uh, sorry, designers. And, and all of them are either winners or uh, talents or nominees drawn from the pool of the Danish uh, Design Award in 2012, which was held in uh, Copenhagen in September. And as you will see from these projects, uh, idea talents presented here today, uh, Danish design has entered into a new phase. Our trademark attention to functionality, simplicity uh, is, is, is still there, but it now meets the urge to integrate into our products and design solutions the process of design thinking uh, that David also mentioned in his uh, opening uh, remarks. And uh, the CEO of the Danish Design Center, Nili Juhl Sørensen, will talk much more about that in his presentation in just a minute. We're still extremely proud of, um, of Danish design uh, furniture as represented uh, by Republic of uh, Fritz Hansen, who's also here uh, with us uh, today. They have actually been very good at taking the old designers and, and, and bringing in new designers. But as you will also see when you see the rising stars uh, being presented here today, Danish design today is, is much more than furniture and lamp. Um, when I'm on a business trip uh, and I reach immigration, then I'm, I'm asked, as you probably are too, uh, business or pleasure. And as I like going on these trips, uh, I, I usually would like to answer both. Uh, but you know, if you if you mess with these things, you're not going to get in. Uh, so I have to I have to make a, a, a choice. But when we talk about design, it is both uh, pleasure and and business. Uh, the world would so certainly not be a, 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 a pleasurable place to be if it wasn't uh, for design. Uh, on the other hand, there is a very clear business case uh, for design. Through design, you make your your products uh, unique, you differentiate them, and you can take a premium price, and you can also create extreme customer uh, loyalty through design. Let me finish where I started with um, the um, Chamber of uh, Trusteeship uh, that uh, Joel also mentioned. It will be open uh, again after a huge renovation in March uh, 2013. Uh, it will bring back new versions of the Fignoul uh, uh, furniture, but since the UN has developed quite a bit, uh, we made a design, the government of Denmark made a design competition, uh, which was won by uh, Kaspar Selzo and Thomas Siskor, 
and which was actually revealed by the Queen of Denmark in New York at the Museum of Modern Art uh, last year. So all this furniture has just arrived in New York. It is uh, being installed, and uh, we look forward to seeing that. And, and uh, my colleague, Carsten Stauer, the UN Ambassador of Denmark, will talk more about that in a later uh, session. So finally, let me thank uh, David, Joel, the, the, the Parsons School uh, of Design for, for doing this event together with us today. It's, it's fantastic to be here. I want to uh, also extend, of course, a big thank uh, to Nile and uh, Susanne from Danish Design Center for your great contribution and helping uh, to curate the, the symposium and the exhibition. And then I would like to, to, to thank our rising stars, as we call you, Tia, Amanda, Anne, Anas, Mess, Trol, Søren, and Johannes, who have traveled the long distance to be with us today, as have the companies of Grundfos, Otikon, and I8. They were also honored at the Danish Design Award for their unique design solutions. You will see that later, and you're all representing uh, the future. Also, of course, a thanks to our distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Paolo Antonelli, who has taken up the challenge to review the inspiring work. Thank you to the Republic of Fritz Hansen, whose sponsorship of this event proves the real commitment to mentoring our new generation of Danish designer. A big thanks to our main New York partners um, here, uh, and uh, also the uh, American Institute of Architecture and the Cuba Hewitt National Design Museum. Everyone have contributed uh, to this. And finally, of course, thank you to all of you for coming here. I hope you will have a great and inspiring day. Thank you. And before we uh, move on to the first uh, keynote speaker of uh, the day's program, uh, just a kind reminder to everybody this, that this uh, symposium is being live video streamed by a very useful media. Uh, the production team, you'll see them in the back. And this means that uh, for all the speakers and uh, also people uh, in the room that would like to ask questions uh, during today's program, please uh, uh, remember to speak into microphones, otherwise uh, your uh, gems will not be recorded. Uh, and we will have uh, throughout the day two runners who will bring microphones uh, out to the floor for questions. And with these words, I would like to uh, make a very short introduction of our, our first keynote uh, today, uh, Nille Juel Sørensen, who has flown in last night from Denmark. Uh, Nille is the uh, CEO and director of the Danish Design Center and has been so since uh, November of 2011. Uh, for almost a decade, he has been the associate uh, director of AROP, which is an, uh, an international uh, design and consulting firm. Um, Nile has also been with uh, KHR Architects, uh, the largest uh, architectural office in Scandinavia. Um, and Nile, in some of these capacities, has been uh, very instrumental uh, and, and deeply engaged in the development and designs for the Copenhagen metro system, both the existing one, but also uh, the new city ranken or circle line that is uh, going to come up over the next few years in Copenhagen. So do uh, feel inspired uh, by today's program and, and look forward to go visiting Copenhagen as well. Um, Nilla has uh, received many uh, honors and awards throughout his career, um, most notably, maybe, the Eckersberg uh, Medal from the uh, Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. This is really the highest, uh, the highest uh, distinction that you can receive in Denmark for architects and, and artists. Uh, Nilla's work has been widely published. Uh, and uh, Nilla is also the board member of uh, Index, designed to improve life. Uh, so with these words, I'm very happy to give the floor over to Nilla Juel Sørensen, who is going to be speaking about Design Society Denmark. What's up? <laughs> Good morning, and... and is this working? Yeah? Okay. You can hear my heart. That's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic introduction by all these nice people. Thank you for having us. Um, and thanks, God, for Sandy. It gave us a week to think about things. I mean, you know, because everything closed down. So I think it was quite smart because then, you know, we couldn't get in touch. 
Um, so you could think about are we on the right track and you know are we there? So I think sometimes these things that interrupt the thing because it was going very fast. It's the first time I worked with a uh, foreign minister who was you know talking and moving at the same time. <laughs> so that was really fantastic because when when we were phoned and said could we move you know the whole Danish design award to New York. I always say yes because you know that will be you know far it will take a long time but this really went fast so thank you Mike and especially and thanks to the Parson School that adopted this um, and to the sponsors because I, I think it's so important that we um, that we get these cross cultural thing and uh, and I think my my age group um, basically very candid fucked it all up you know that's it. I mean, we lost it completely. We lost the economy. Uh, we just um, we just blew it all. You know, too much fossil fuel. You know, not thinking about the whole globe, everything. So, you know, our existence because we can actually live longer, and hopefully they can you know, replace everything, so I can be a hundred years old. Is the young people? So we need young designers. We need young creative people that can actually move the world for us. And so, so my generation is out. We just have to step back and, and see, you know, what can we do? So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what is Denmark and, and where is design going. Uh, as you can hear, I've I done a lot of things before and uh, I always been, um, I never kept my mouth shut. So I always taking part in the debate, criticizing a lot about Danish design, criticizing Danish design center. And then this new job came up and I just actually uh, applied for it as a joke because that was, <laughs> The problem is with jokes sometimes, you know, you know, you get the job. <laughs> so I got your job and I'm very honored and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm shaping a totally new team. I'm shaping, shaping a totally new center who is much more agile, much more based on, on other values than we've been before. I'll talk a little bit about that. But that, that's where the design center comes from. So, you know, basically we, in our uh, strategy, uh, designers was not mentioned the last five years. And that's really weird, isn't it? That you have a title and then inside, you know, they're not there. So we're trying to get designers back in and especially young designers. So I think where, where we come from is um, there's a Danish um, uh, writer and a TV presenter who said that uh, a country is the mostly known uh, on its inventions. And in Denmark, we invented the cork belt for, you know, uh, and the next thing is the ant abuse. <laughs> so that maybe tells you about a society. You know, th th there's, a, there's a lot of other things you invented, you know, and the last one is this one who's a really hip uh, Skype. But uh, basically, it's a, it's a funny culture, and I, and I think we have to go back to find out, you know, why is, why is design so important? That has something to do with the culture. And we are talking about the design society. We have the most designed society, uh, that's what, how I see it. It's not designed by designers, and that's really, that's really good, because sometimes design is too important to leave it to the designers. So we need someone else to design it, and I don't know why. I think we, we were a bunch of farmers. If you look at Sweden, who's our neighbor, they are industrial. Uh, they know how to scale things. All big companies from the Scandinavian countries, they are. We just have Quanfoss, Danfoss, and Novo as the big ones, and Mask. The rest is, uh, is on the Swedish side. They're really good at scaling Hennes and Mauer, you know, that they know how to do that. We, we know how to make other kind of things. But so it, it's a society. And I'll just tell you a little bit about this society. What is it that makes a difference? And, and one thing is that because we're a bunch of farmers, we found out we couldn't sell things, you know, as small farms. So we made what is called a co-op. It's pure communism. When I'm in China, I talk about this, you know, it's, it's actually better than whatever they ever done. So you, as a small farmer, you deliver in, and then you can sell the big things. And now we have products which are, you know, really icons, bacon, butter, and all these things. But it comes out that we, you know, small move together. You know, we take care of each other. We don't have cracks in society. If there's a crack, we try to try to figure out how to how to fix that. So that's also why in Europe that we have bigger problems south of the Alps and north of the Alps because there's a there's a me tradition maybe more in the south, in the Nordic countries, it's a we tradition because we know that if I'm not paying tax, 55% tax, um, I'm a burden. So it's better to get me back on the job and get me running. So that's how it thinks. Another thing is, is lifelong learning. 
And in Denmark, when you have an education, you continue your whole work life to be educated. When I was working in London, I said after half a year, okay, now we have to go to a course to get some, you know, get updated. And they said, what do you mean? I said, we have, we have to educate our employers. They said, uh, they, they already have an education. I said, no, no, but that's five years old. They need to, you know, said, no, no. So that was a shock for me because I'm so used to that in Denmark, we have lifelong education. We also have that families for uh, summer holidays go to a high school, what well, we, we call it high school, but where they actually have a week or two week program where they learn about culture and other things. So, so that's how can you actually have a population of five million people and constantly get new knowledge and also you can transfer people from one sort of area into another one like, you know, like the printing, the people who did all the printing, there was nothing, you know, when Quark Express and InDesign came around, you know, there's like sort of couple of thousand people who had to find a new job, so we did that. Um, this one is how we actually take a mortgage out in our houses, private houses. That's why a lot of Danes have owned their housing. They own their properties because the way we can get a mortgage is that we actually, again, pool together. So it's a lot of small lenders who actually make the big ones, and that means we have this called, it's called the Yay and that's a quite a cool word, isn't it? But that's how you actually borrow money because you borrow money of other people so you pool it and um, quite smart system so a lot of workers in Denmark will own their um, own properties and that means you know we won't have a revolution because everybody is in to move around you know it's about making money for you so but that's another you know that's a whole political thing about it <clears throat> we have other system we have something called the return bubble system if you go to a, a supermarket you'll have young people standing there just putting a the bottles into the thing. And I asked sometime, uh, once, a couple of weeks ago, I asked one, why do you do it? And he looked at me, you know, are you an idiot? <laughs> and I said, um, no, why do you do it? He said, because I want my money back. And I said, yeah, I know that, but do you know the, the larger system? And he just looked at me like, you know, he didn't want to know. So, and I was really happy because that's a design system on how you, how you have, um, you, when you buy your Coke, you pay a kroner for the bottle, and when you give the bottle back, you know, you get your kroner. But that's how the whole system is recycling, reusing plastic bottles and uh, aluminium cans and glass bottles. So it's a really cool system, and it's just, it's been there for so many years that we don't, you know, it's just there. And I think if we can design systems in the future that has these qualities that we actually don't know this is designed but it's just there because you know it just makes us happier. It makes us smarter. So I think that's the background, and that's the other things that goes on. This is biking. I know in New York. You know we have our specialist, Jan Gehl, is here trying to teach the New Yorkers how to get bike lanes in, and you know what's going on. We have enormous amount of bikes. We have the lakes is crossed every day by over thirty thousand bikes. So biking is like a Tour de France. You have to push yourself in the morning, you know, to get over. And as you know, it's tough to be a biking. But we have a huge design, you know, we have different, all kind of different bikes who's designed for different purposes. And I'm asked uh, by the government, design, you know, is there any money in design? And I said, yeah, 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 there's a lot of money. He said, prove it. And it's very, very difficult to prove it. So we're now starting with some PhD students to find out what is the money in biking? So there's a new bike every month designed. There's a cup holder, cigarette holders, a helmet. I mean, the whole you know, merchandise around biking is enormous. But the problem is that in Denmark, in the Danish statistics, if you're selling bikes, then you're under the metal thing. If you are selling cup holders, there's something else. So you, they can never get, the, you know, they never get the statistics in because they're spread too much. And the really cool card is that if you bike for 10 years, you have uh, postponed your visit to the hospital for five years, and then you can just figure out, you know, that's a, I don't know how many thousands of dollars a day if you enter a hospital. So this is really good for society, it's really good for you, it's good for everybody, it's good for the city. You have a, you get, you know, the urban thing back, and it's good for designers because there's so much to design. <clears throat> the another thing is that we are actually moving into wind energy. We were so lucky to have people in the 70s when the oil crisis came, we actually sat down and said, we need to change the game. It would be like, it would be nice to in a generation to have, a, you know, have something else going on. And by, I think it's 2015, we will have 80% renewable energy and 20% uh, fossil. 
So they're just changing the whole thing. And that's why when you land, fly into Copenhagen, you will have all these uh, windmills. And they are owned by the people of Copenhagen. You buy your share, so you can buy it for $20, uh, $200, whatever you like. So you buy shares in the windmill. We decided that uh, instead of building swimming pools, why don't we just clean the water? You know, we're surrounded by water, so why not clean it? And then we had uh, Bjarke and uh, Schulen to design the new uh, harbor swimming pool. So it's just you jump into the harbor and you swim there. And the problem is now that everybody's jumping in everywhere in the harbor. So the rescue people, so now there's a new design competition for a ladder. So how can they put ladders around in the harbor so you can get out because there's about three meters, right? So um, it's not that cool when you jump in and you find out you have to swim like 500 meters to, to get up. But, uh, but that, that's what happens when, you know, when these recreations are available. I mean, this is a good day. Some summers we have two of these days. Other ones, sometimes we have a month. But uh, this year we had two of these days. That was really nice. It's a Wednesday and Thursday. <laughs> Another thing is that, you know, we, we're not into revolutions. Absolutely not. Uh, because we're farmers, then we think about, you know, what's the weather, you know, how are things going. So, but south of us, we have a few nations, Germany and France. They're into revolutions. They are fast movers and, you know. So they've done a lot of things. And... When we had the modern of architecture coming through with the Le Corbusier and the Bauhaus, you know, Danes were sitting put, watching what is going on. And the cool thing was that we got, after the war, we got the photos, black and white photos from America. What should architecture look like? And all the architects said, whoa. We couldn't see that the detailing was really bad. So we thought that the, the detailing, because everything has to be simple, the detailing had to be really, really nice. Um, and also, we, we wanted to avoid this. You know, basically, for a bunch of farmers, it's, it's not really cool to be living on the third floor or the 30th floor, right? We like to live close, so five stories, that's acceptable. Anything else is not acceptable. So this was not it. So we designed things in a, in a different way. And the new architects of today are a lot more urban. There's a lot more things going on around your buildings. It's not about the detailing any longer. They moved out, so it's about how to engage in the social spaces, the urban spaces. And yes, the detailing in Bjarke's buildings are really, really bad. But you really, really have a nice time together with all these bad details that you don't see, right? <laughs> Except if you're an architect. So I think the people who are living there, they're having a fantastic time. And then we can rebuild it, you know, whatever. But I think, you know, it's a lot better to have fun, to engage the public, into a piece of, of common design, you know, um, social design, than just being a smart thing. And the, the problem is that Arne Jakobsen also, he was, he's always, you know, uh, even in Denmark, they call him the, the furniture architect. And it really pisses me off because he's absolutely not a furniture architect. He's an architect. He just, he just introduced the new system that actually female went to work Everything was changed after the war and just before the war, you know, in the 30s, where these things are from. That was a new style, everything. So you couldn't have the old furniture in, my, uh, in his architecture. It was not fit, you know, there was something wrong. You couldn't have modern architecture when you came in. There was something wrong with furniture. So why not? Because he was, you know, talented. He just redesigned everything inside it. So his furniture had always been following his architecture. And I think that's very important when you look at these things. It was not something that just came out of, you know, oh, yeah, we don't want the upholstery, so that's why we go about it. Uh, it was actually because it was in time, it was in a thing, so that's where, you know, Danish modern started. And I think, you know, um, <clears throat> Danish modern, now we're talking Apple, Samsung. This is the China chair. We stole it in China in 1800 something. And this is the China chair by Hans Jörn Wiener, and, you know, I think when you steal someone's design and you make it yourself, then it's okay. And that's what he did, right? If you just borrow, then it's not good enough. So, I mean, that's where it came from. This is the chair that sort of boosted the whole thing. And then at that time, we were really good at doing product placement before we knew something was called product placement. This is, you know, Kennedy, the first live uh, presidential debate ever in 60-something with Nixon. Young president needed to be sitting in a young chair, needed to be, you know. So that's why this chair came in. I think if you see the sales, it just went by that. This one has a little more dodgy side to it. This is Kirsten Keeler. 
She was a nice looking lady who had a love affair with a foreign minister in the British government called Pofumo. There's nothing wrong with that in Britain. Yeah? He was married, of course. And so, but the problem was that she also you know, had a relationship with the Soviet ambassador. And she was sort of, you know, pillow talking, so I don't know. So anyway, she was arrested, and because she was beautiful at that time in the 60s, they put her in this chair, and they took a lot of photos. At the same time, if you look at the Fritz Hansen sales, they went up, because this is a, a Arne Jacobsen chair. No, it's not. The really fun thing is this is a copy. So she, that's why Fritz Hansen never using it. She was sitting in a copy, but everybody couldn't see that it was a copy. So it actually made the sales start. So things like that pushed it in. And of course, we were using, we were using uh, wood. We were using new materials in different ways. So you know, we had these nice shapes, and everything was coming up. You know, we were doing quite well. And there's more of these chairs. You know, the coolest thing was that some of them were actually uh, designed for the co-op. So it's actually the idea was that it was a uh, the working class should be able to buy these chairs. Of course, when you come up here, then they get a little more expensive. But that one up there, the first one, is is things you could buy in in a in a Bruce, you know, a co-op in Denmark. Which I think, you know, that was the whole socialist thought about it that that we should be able to buy these things because you buy one chair and you will have it for life. The thing is that the most popular chairs today is still these chairs. That's what we are known for. That's what we are famous for. And you could say that's, that's really odd when you meet young designers. And everybody <laughs> knows a chair from 39. And they don't know what was designed in year 2000. So how can we, how can we change this uh, thing? So th this, is, uh, this is the Danish plastic period. We basically just had one designer. You know, when plastic came around, you can see that uh, all the Danish uh, shops in America, they sort of stopped. They didn't want to, the wood was out. Uh, so plastic was in. The Italians took over. We just had a Werner Panson, and he was not very much liked in Denmark because he was too, too many colors. You know, Danes never really like to sit in a plastic chair because there's something when you touch it, you know. And, and so since that, we never, we never really hit the curve just with a few things coming in. And then we designed all these things, you know, uh, industrial design for the home. Uh, we have 10,000 white coffee cups, blue coffee cups, you can get it, everything. And this is, this is not for the posh people. This is basically what most Danes have, you know, depend on what they like, they have it. And we, and we produce it, produce it, produce it. So you could say, you know, are we actually at the limit where we, you know, we, we can't, can there be another coffee pot or? So I uh, hope, you know, very gladly, a lot of young designers are now moving into to design washing machine, new bikes, a uh, lot of graphic designs, a lot of using materials in a different way. So you can see that as a trend on that we're moving out of um, furniture. And the problem is basically, if you go to some of the Danish furniture companies with a new chair, they will not take you because they have another chair from the 50s who are still selling very, very well. So why should they outcompete themselves with a new thing? So that could be the showstopper for this. But you know, designers are moving slowly, but uh, into another direction. This is just to tell you, it's uh, how how wild things are doing in Denmark now. This is a clock designed by Anna Jacobsen in '37. It was designed for the people of a huge organization called NKT, and so it was a gift to all the workers. It was, you know. Black with a nice green. One year after, because it, you know, it never really took off, they closed the production, hidden it away. And then uh, another company buys it from the Arne Jacobsen family. So this one is designed in 2011. Huh? So they found out we can't sell the, the black one because iPod came in, you know. So we just make it in white. And then they said, okay, what else have Arne Jacobsen done? Oh, he's done a few clocks for banks, so he has this called the bankers. Oh, we just take that typeface and then we scale it down and then you could put it into this one. So now there's a whole industry of the ones who have the access to the Arne Jacobsen, to Finn Juhl and all you, and how can we sample out of it? So this is actually a design, you know, which is sampled from 37 up to 2011. And I think when I see this, I really get scared because what will be the next? This is not, I mean, 
this is not a proud nation who are into design, you know, who wants to show the world. That, that's not the way we should do it. We, that should be another way. And uh, hopefully there's, there's someone who's showing a way. This is Index Award, um, giving out the biggest, largest prize in the world for design to improve life. And it's designed to improve life for Americans, for people in Africa, India, all over the world. And the prices have been very varying from uh, iTunes to uh, whatever uh, funny project. But I, I think it, it's, it's about how can, we, how can we change things without, and how can we design things that, that has a future. This is one of the ones that uh, in Denmark was really, we call it the hole in one for an organization because everybody could understand that this was, the design of this one was really improving people's life. You just stick that straw into the dirty water and then you suck and it will uh, clean it. And it's just a lot of uh, fabrics. It's done by a company in Denmark who did workmen's clothes for 100 years, but due to you know uh, a lot of things, they were outcompeted with the first uh, companies in Poland and then in the Far <coughs> East. So the young, um, the young family member, he started working on these things. So first he made a, a tent that is actually sprayed with a mosquito thing as mosquito net uh, for the UN. Then he did this one, um, which got the index price. And now you, 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 we can buy it. And then we, I think we buy it for, I can't remember how many dollars. And then that will add so the UN can buy more of them. And so he has a private person. You can. The next thing was this one. When you come to a refugee camp in Darfur, you get a tent. A tent is a piece of plastic. The problem is when, uh, when they are attacked, um, all the people just fly, flew away, run away. They have to collect them. And we're not talking about 200 people. We're talking about 250,000 people in a camp. So you have to find out where are they, how do we get them back, how do we feed them. And so they spend a lot of resources um, driving around, you know, because it's a huge area. So what he asked, he asked, he phoned NASA and said, uh, what is the color you can see on your satellite photo? Because as an NGO organization, you can get access to NASA's uh, uh, satellites. So to say, that's the green, the green one. And he said, thank you very much. So they changed the color on all the tents. So that means when they have a attack in the night, the next morning they get a satellite from NASA, and then you can go in here, you can see where they are. So they know exactly where they are because they have the GPS coordination. So very fast they can get people back. So it's just, you know, designing, you know, for a totally new market, but you know, maybe we are back to the, to the few designs I was talking about before. So um, when I came into the Danish Design Center and we had this Danish Design Award, I thought, oh, another chair, another coffee cup, can we change it, you know? Can you change it uh, immediately? But also to keep myself out of it, I, I said I will not be in the jury uh, because that's not fair. So uh, I, you know, I was trying to talk to the jury behind the curtains, you know, saying, you know, we, we need to change this. And maybe we don't want to do a revolution, so can we just, uh, you know, move it slowly towards something which are uh, maybe more modern. So I'll just show you that this here is a fantastic design that could have been designed in the 20s. It's about how the leg actually grab a beam. And I think it's, it's so simple, it's so Danish in a way. You know, it's just so, yeah, you know, very pragmatic. Let's do it that way. But on the other hand, it also, you know, it, it connects to what I think is sort of typical Dan Danish design. It's, it's very simple, you know, yeah. When you see it, when you find out what it's doing, you think, oh yeah. Why didn't I do this, you know, myself 30 years ago? No, because you have to think a lot because before it gets so simple that, but I think this is a design that links back to the old masters in a way. And this one is by We Do Wood, which is uh, made out of, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, fiber from uh, bamboo. So it, it's a, this is a small uh, children chair for a child. But I think all they you know, they are, they're doing, they're actually going back, trying to link into um, the tradition, but changing how uh, they produced, how do we get rid of the thing? Um, you can very easily, you know, detach all the parts and use it for something else. So the whole, I think the designers are now coming around, you know, how do we, it's not just about designing a piece, it's about a whole holistic uh, view of it. And also that we move design into, into places where it's never been before. This is an eye care 
thing. So if you get any acid when you're working, you know, in your eyes, you can, you can, uh, you know, bathe them, get it out here. And it's very simple. The whole thing, the way it's hanging on the wall, everything is in a design that's working. So you know, again, design moving from sort of, you know, being a, an object into taking, you know, trying to get a solution going. <clears throat> And this is a pump. This is uh, one of the biggest companies in Denmark, Grundfos. They have been uh, they've been known for doing pumps all their life. And for a few years ago, they came up with the idea: we don't do pumps any longer. We do clean water. And a lot of Danes thought well, they still do pumps, don't they? <laughs> um, yeah, but the whole thing about cleaning water that that gives a totally new, because that's a design philosophy, that gives you a totally new philosophy. So it's not about the bloody pump. It's all about how do we deliver clean water. So this one is the first pump, uh, which is actually, the, even the pump is nicely designed. It's very smart because it's also working with an iPhone or an Android phone. So it's not about just having you know some of these pumps in your um, shopping mall. They all connected. They they can actually be run. You get all the data out. You can actually you can drive your pumps in a totally different way. The whole energy thing is going down, and we have it outside, so you can see it. And there's people from Grundfos there. So it's what I call sort of a huge a, a thing. You know, it's not a it's not a nice small piece, but a bit it's it's really cool because you can do so much. It's so much more than just a piece of design. So it's about how do it fit into the to the wider context. And just imagine all the data they can collect now on all the customers worldwide, and how can they use that data to, to sign something for their customers so they get more clean water. That's the challenge. <clears throat> this one is another one. It's called Endomondo. If you're running, I mean, I don't run because I think it's the most boring thing. I would like to play basketball or anything where I can talk to people and we can sort of you know, be mates instead of just running. I, and I think it's really, it must really be boring to run, you know, you can't talk to anyone, you know, this, uh, then you can come back and say, I did 10 kilometers, and you can say, yeah, and so what? <laughs> so, but these guys, they done the right thing, they actually made an app, and it's, I think it's out by the 10 millions are using this. But it connects you so you can run against someone else, you can actually run real time, five kilometers against someone else on the other you know, in Japan at the same time, or in China, or in Denmark, and it will, you know, it gives you all these figures. You can find out all your friends, where are they, how have they been running, you know, and blah, 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 blah. So you can say from just being a runner, now you're in a community, and that is typically Danish. We would like to be a community. You know, if you do something, we all, you know, you don't do it on your own, you do it with your mates, and you know. So this is, I think this is a cool thing, and the, the graphics is really cool, and they just moved to Silicon Valley to get more money into the system because, you know, in Denmark, they, to finance these things, you know, it's a little bit difficult for Danes that you can't feel it right, but, uh, you know, we'll get used to it. <clears throat> this is another one. This is a, uh, um, Anna Danielson, and you, you know, you'll hear about some of these later today, but it's, it's a quite a tough thing. She actually went into uh, hospital care. One of the biggest thing is that people get the wrong medicine, or they get too much or too little, or uh, it's the wrong patient, right? There's so many mistakes, and they probably do a lot of cover up. Uh, and you know, in Denmark, we don't have a, we don't have digital journals, so they can't follow you. So that's actually parts of the of the day where you shouldn't go to hospital because you'll be lost, right? And there's always driving one emergency ambulance around in Copenhagen constantly. And they don't know where it's going. It's just someone who's trying to get rid of the patient somewhere. So data will actually show all these things. So she actually worked with the, you know, the nurses, the doctors to find out how do we get, you know, how do we get in touch with the patient? How do we get, you know, mistakes coming down? And she will tell you a lot more about this. But this is designing a system. This is designing something, you know, it's not about the tray. The tray could look very nice, but it's designing the whole system. It's working with people, different kind of people and in integrated teams that can deliver this really nice solution that will save life and money. <clears throat> Another thing, hearing aids. I mean, you know, when I was young, you know, all my, my classmates who had a hearing aid, you could see it because they were walking like they were so big, you know, it's weighed 100 kilos. Now, we are down to these one, uh, very, you can see it up here, it's just sticking out of her up here. And so even things that, you know, um, 
it's just for a, a, a special percentage of the people around you. They need they need design which are well designed. I know. So it's it's not about that you know. Yes, you have a problem you can hear that can be good sometimes. Other times it's bad. But you know you can actually have a thing that will help you. And we can see with the technology that's coming now. You operate camera into your eyes so blind people can see because of a camera. So you know how do we do that? You know how do we design it so you don't look like somebody who comes out of an Armageddon movie or something like that? So you know I think this is really a nice way of doing uh, design that for people. And this one, I think Tia will talk about it. It's about kids who are um, born too early and you know, you put them in this uh, thing. Um, and, and I'll leave it to her. It's, it's a fantastic design. It's about when you see how it's done today, you think we are not in 2013. So it's about sticking uh, uh, handkerchiefs under the baby and you know, uh, fixing it, this problem. <laughs> And no one, no one ever thought, oh, here's a way that actually designers can work. So I, I think, you know, if you are a young designer and you're out of work, you know, get yourself an emergency award, you know, and just have a, you know, pen and pencil, you know, I think you'll find a couple of things that needed to be redesigned. <clears throat> a lot of her sketches, I think it's still, you know, the methodology that we have in Denmark for young designers are still very, very unique. It's a teacher and you sitting around a table is two by two. You know, a one by one discussion, it is you sketching, it's the whole. So I, I say you can change a lot as long as the methodology, and I think that's what we are surviving. So I always say, I know that uh, China put design on the five year plan. And, um, and that means that there will be about a million Chinese designers coming out, and they will be really good. They will, they will be better, smarter, cheaper, faster, you know. That's, that's two things they need. And one thing they can probably get over a couple of years, the one thing is the methodology. The methodology of how young designers are taught in Denmark. That's the one thing. And the next, the last thing is the whole having the humans in the center of the universe. There, that will probably take a few generations before they get that one. So we can relax a little bit, not much, but, uh, you know. But we're just in the styling business, we'll be out of here. This is a fantastic, it's won the Danish Design Award. It's a playground. It's a playground that is playing also with the symbols. So they've taken all the symbols of the Danish church, um, the um, parliament, and all these things, you know, which is power symbols. And then they scaled them down to kid size and put them into uh, something we call Fellepark. And that's where we have the 1st of May, you know, all the uh, demonstration things, and that they go in here. So they just scaled it down. They put a lot of electronics in so you can still here the bells goes from um, the different churches. So you have the round tower up there that was by <coughs> Christian the fourth and you know so if you've been to Copenhagen you can see all these nice things they just scaled them down and then they put them into this playground and, and I think it's so cool my wife and I walks in the park we just live there to it and you know when they were building it we were talking well, why do they why do they build you know uh, Queen's Castle you know half of the Queen's Castle what is this and you know mirrors and everything and then when it opened it's been filled with kids. It's absolutely you know, just packed. Um, and so the problem is actually that they, re they, have, they now redesigned the whole park because you know you can see this. So if you're one kid inside, then there's a mother outside or a father outside. And they come with these huge bikes where they have all the stuff in front of them. So if you start, and this is like a, you know, a logistic thing, like a supermarket. How many bike spaces do you need for 500 kids? You know, that means a thousand of these outside. So, so it, it's quite big and they're trying to, to figure it out. It, it's working perfectly. And this, this is another thing. This is by Amanda. You will also, she will also be here. Um, Cool thing, she's actually got an inspiration from Iran. And that is actually, in my world, she'll probably talk more, that is morphed with her inspiration from a traditional Danish Leclint lamp, so how to fold things. All the stuff I've seen from Amanda, she always folds things. So it's even, it's Japanese Leclint, you know, <laughs> Danish design icon with how do light penetrates a roof in, um, in Iran. And I think that's a modern design. A modern design is someone who's been around, who's seen it, who's sniffing all the things, and, and then putting it into a different context. But, but I think th this is about the most precious thing we have, that is light. And I know here you just switch on the light and that's it. Wow. In Denmark, if you come to Copenhagen, you can't get scared because it's very dark. It's 50 lux. That is pitch dark compared to here, so it's probably, you know, 
you know, but that's because we, by, by law, is keeping the locks down because it, it's, very, it's very expensive to run all these lights. And it's not good for your environment. At the same time, you lose the tactileness of your city. So, of course, if you just have glass things, you, you, you lose that. But, but, it, but by having it, so when you're walking in Copenhagen with the brick buildings, you still see this is brick. It's not just a, something cardboard thing. So that's why it's very low. And I think this one is that, you know, when we have, because, we, you know, it's dark in Denmark, you know, November it gets dark at 3 o'clock. So, you know, when you come home, you switch on your lamp. The way the light is distributed into your room, that's still, and this, this is recycled plastic. So again, it's about, it can be flat packed, so you don't have to, you know, do all these things to send it, so it's smart. So it's about thinking things in. Of course, you know, Amanda will probably move to something else that will be degradable in one or two years, or maybe not even there. <clears throat> And this, this is just to, to move you a little bit. So this is a, a design duo called Ben and Sebastian. Absolutely not cases. But I think they're so inspiring because they are, are they carpenters? Are they uh, cabinet makers? Are they designers? What are they actually? They're actually two uh, guys educated as architects, but they start making fun of everything. So they have tables. So if you can push a button on this table, then these things will stick up like you know like can die if you so if you put something it will just go off different kind of legs and and they put their things into um, into old museums so when if you go to the design museum you can walk around there and you think oh fantastic pieces then you when you start looking at it it's someone who's playing and this is a chair that can be totally unfolded when you actually fold it together it looks like a normal chair but then you can actually start unfolding it so it's get about 10 meters long while you fold it absolutely useless <laughs> but I think it's so good that sometimes you know you can sit there and then you can laugh a little bit because I think it's so important that humor is there I mean in, in Denmark play is you know that's why we have Lego Lego you know how to play is, is, a, is, a, is a part of our sort of genes and our tradition we have to play you know so when things get really serious let's play right and when you play you can probably solve a lot of things so I think while you're unpacking and packing that chair you probably you know you think about you know things that you should solve and work or whatever um, and th this is uh, another one which is absolutely useless I love her I love her creations you know uh, I think her market share is maybe <laughs> 0 0.1111 in the whole world but I think every time I see her stuff, this is made out of straws. So she just went to McDonald's and other places and just nicked a whole lot of these straws and put these fantastic dresses. I, I, she claims you can wear them. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also just an inspiration that by using a commodity, you can actually twist it in a direction where you think, oh. So I think the people who are looking at this what they should be doing is how can I move that into uh, the step further so it actually can be mass produced and you know produced in the right way and all these things. But as an inspiration, I think um, we're moving this way. This is a lot of different kind of goat skins that where she prints stuff on, and then she makes these nicer uh, hats or whatever we call them, you know, with a little monkey. And so it's always this uh, this fun thing going on. And I think where we're going, and hopefully you can see that with the things you'll see the rest of the day is that, you know, we, we enter this thing I call World 3.0. I mean, we, we, need, we need to do things different, quite different. And we have a little gap before it really gets serious. So, so if we could start now slowly, and I think the creative people, the designers are the one who should move it. So I think this is the first time for a long time I see a talent pool in Denmark of young designers. You know, for a couple of years there was no really talent. You know, or nothing happened. I think now I think there's a, a lot of young people who are asking the right question, who is trying to answer the right uh, um, questions. And also, I think you know this is the world's biggest design project. That is to change the use that we now use three of these ones, and we should get down on one very fast. And I think you know designers are the one one who can get us out of here. And that's why I'm so glad to be here with a lot of young designers. We're not there there yet, you know. Some of them have to learn to, you know, be pushed further out. But I think we need both. We need also design, which I call a, 
uh, you know, fall in love design, something you just fall in love with, you just love it, it's absolutely useless, you have it, you know, it's nice to, you know, but it's, it's not doing anything. <coughs> we need that, but then we also need design who's actually trying to give us uh, a better and a, and a totally different world that everybody can see themselves in. So, thank you very much, and I'm hopefully you're looking forward to see more of these designers. They will be here. But we will have a short coffee break, 10 minutes. Is that correct? First, we'll take a few questions. Okay, if there's any questions, and remember to speak into the microphone. <coughs> Do we have any questions? <laughs> no, it was so clear. That's, that's good. <laughs> I'm amazed. Who designed the core film? Uh, that's the really problem because when I read this, I thought, oh, uh, shit, what is a core film? And then I, 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 you know, I have Google Translate because I, I can't spell. So I, I, my wife told me to use Google to help me spelling. Uh, thank you very much. She's here uh, because she's tired of. You know. so, uh, so I put Corkbelt in, and then I put it on translate. It didn't want to translate. So I don't know if the official title is a Corkbelt. Maybe, you know, the States never got it, you know, as a cork. Then it was, you know, morphed into something else. But I can't find out who did it. But it's, it is a Danish thing. The, the interviews is, is done by two guys in the 40s. And it was meant for something else, like the Viagra. You know, it was... Uh, it was a drug for something else, and then they found out that when these guys, they actually had a beer, then they got really sick. So, um. <laughs> okay. Let's have some questions. Thank you, Nilla. Thank you very much for a very uh, uh, amazing and useful, I think, overview uh, uh, spanning a lot of decades and taking us all the way up to the present uh, so we can see uh, what it is that we are tackling uh, and challenged by um, today.